the advantages to having PK, immunogenicity, and biomarker under, all under one roof for the sponsor is it, it gives the, us the ability to solve all those problems, obviously, and has a tremendous amount of advantage in terms of uh, the ability to save you time and money. And what I mean by that for our sponsors is if, if we start on a given platform, for example, ligand binding assay, any of that information that we glean from that assay that's not working can quickly pivot to our hybrid team and sort of vice versa, that, that's one major advantage. Yeah, I mean, to say, I think it's similar, right? It, it, you don't always know up front what's the best answer. And if you're having lots of options, that sponsor, again, can go faster. It's more efficient for them. They um, can get to the right technology as quick as possible without compromising their study, their stability, their time, their money, all of that. Yeah, so that's a good point. The sponsor has uh, sleeps a little bit better at night knowing that they don't have to have samples going to various laboratories. They don't have to worry about, uh, you can conserve the sample. It's a big benefit is to be able to use less sample because it's all under one roof. Uh, so obviously a, one aliquot can be parsed out to multiple service lines if needed. And then if the drug has any instability, that has a lot of advantages to be able to take that one sample out, run it on a LB, by LCMS for instance, and then flip it to ligand binding assays. And then also, I really do think that we can work, we can work in parallel. So if you are um, kind of under the gun a little bit and you don't have a, you know an exorbitant amount of time and you're still trying to figure out how to get your PK method up and running, uh, we can just start it by LBA and hybrid and it's, we kind of make it into a race. It's a lot yeah, of fun. And maybe the other part too really is, um, I think it's a big investment for a sponsor to pick a lab to do their work. And so having, um, one, one MSA, one CDA, one kind of set of paperwork speeds up their stuff, but also having multiple choices and plan Bs already kind of backup plans for if something doesn't work really gives them maybe peace of mind and um, options to kind of go forward instead of starting over if it doesn't work wherever they picked the first time. And, and any remnant samples, we can go back and do retrospective biomarker analysis. It's all right there. So, and that can be done really quickly and really cost effectively as well because you don't have to ship site samples all over the globe to get them. We already have them. If you do choose to do some retrospective work, we can really quickly get those samples analyzed for you. So we do a lot of PK analysis and we have lots of choices for that. And I think what we typically would do is start with a really good conversation with the sponsor to understand what are they trying to do and what might be the um, pitfalls or kind of caveats or things that they might, you know, molecule in instabilities or something where um, it might help us pick a technology up front so, you know, if they say, for example, you know, you're going to have to um, differentiate one amino acid different from something else. Mm -hmm. That's going to kind of tell us up front, okay, a reagent from an LBA standpoint might have a hard time differentiating that. Whereas hybrid mass spec, you can take advantage of the mass spec to really um, allow you to do that. So, so we kind of try to have those um, conversations early and often to um, allow us to help them pick the best technology and sometimes sponsors will maybe have a preference up front. They're, they're an LBA person, they're a mass spec person and sometimes we have to navigate that if we agree with that's the right direction and other times we'll say we can do either so you have a preference, we'll, we'll go that direction but then we always want to go back and forth with the science to make sure that's really giving them the answer to help you know their drug development process. So yeah. it could be mass spec, could be LBA, could be PCR, yeah. cytometry. We, we get asked this one all the time, yeah. right? Like help, oftentimes I, I think Don it is a conversation, but we, we know like if someone's got a preference towards a platform, they're gonna be more comfortable with that one. So if they, for example, have developed it internally by ligand binding assay, it's a natural progression to go to ligand binding assay. If they've used hybrid mass spec, then it's, it's pretty straightforward. But Typically when people are asking that, they've either had an issue somewhere, <laughs> and that's where they're looking for us to kind of say, hey, how do you solve my LBA problem? And that's usually where people start. That's kind of the default platform. And, or it's, hey, someone else tried it by hybrid because of what Donna just talked about. There is something unique about the drug that requires some sensitivity or even specificity that the ligand binding assay takes a lot more effort and work, and you need to generate critical reagents, and we can talk about yeah. how that's a key feature about how you answer this type of question and 
segues nicely because when I talk about critical reagents, in order to do what Dom was talking about in terms of single amino acid differences between your drug and some endogenous protein, you're going to have to generate a lot of critical reagents to do that. But the hybrid mass spec allows you to just pull the protein out, digest it, use the mass spec as a high end, really gives you the specificity and sensitivity you need. So now your question about what we recommend, well, if you have no reagents, right, and a lot of people started that, or you got to use commercial reagents, there are, there are good, you know, generic assays that you can do by ligand binding assay, but often if it's a complex drug, something that might have some multiple bispecific antibodies, some sort of fusion protein that's got a couple different valencies to it, we work with a lot of unique compounds that might be a bispecific that's fused to another bispecific and now you got this quadrivalent uh, entity inside of a well that requires uh, some sophisticated bioanalysis and uh, if you don't have the right critical reagents the certainly the hybrid mass spec is, is, is definitely a better tool if your reagents aren't uh, as uh, I call them like if there's promiscuity amongst the reagents and they're not picking up your drug specifically the mass spec's able to clean that up on the back. Yeah, and if you have um, potentially an instability section, let's say part of the molecule you might be worried that could fall off. So then again, to Dom's point, if you want to kind of multiplex and follow different parts of that molecule, it's easier to then always relying on critical reagents, although it's possible, mm -hmm. to um, multiplex that and pick several different parts of that molecule. And again, that could lend itself to mass spec. So it, it really depends on um, a lot of the questions we ask up front and what the sponsor's preference is. But we try to, um, you know, get to those as quickly as possible so that we can really give you the right solution. For Just your say you love LBA. I, I do love LBA. <laughs> Half of my work is LBA, right? Yeah, the front end. The front end. end. So you but, know. You know, th this is a, a a great the question that again we get asked all the time, and we we really do enjoy answering it. Yeah, we see it all <laughs> um, from any sort of congiates to um, I kind of touched on those multivalent beasts that really uh, we've, we've seen a whole yeah, myriad modalities. of things yeah. and uh, small you know, molecule drugs, biomarkers, oligos, conjugates and the conjugates can be traditional drug conjugates mm. with toxins and payloads. They can be siRNA conjugates, which are a little bit more popular lately, and oligos attached to things, or they can be peptides attached to things, um, and any kind of what I would call Frankenstein molecules, right, that you can put it together however you want. We pretty much tried yeah. and seen and We can support gene therapies, right? A lot yeah, of gene therapies. Gene therapies. Um, so we got PCR under the same roof. That yeah. allows us to look at any sort of uh, maybe PK or PD assay for support of uh, gene therapies. LNPs is an area LNPs, that we're very good yeah. at. And Lipids, can, biomarkers. Yeah, we can do them both by mass spec as well as by uh, yeah. more cytokines. PCR. Yeah, it just gives us a, yeah. you know, when it, we're, we often talk about being agno agnostic to the drug type because we, we do see it all. And some of the things that people are doing now is really creative where you dose with a second drug to release the first drug. Yeah, and yeah. some of them are in like a... Um, like a trigger kind yeah, of... Yeah, a trigger yeah, assays. Pro drug option. And then there's pro yeah. drugs. And what Dom means by that is a drug isn't active until it gets into like a certain environment, like a tumor microenvironment. And then the antibody binding site is freed up. It's got this little... Kind of cap on yeah, it and, or then, and of course it's yep. a bioanalytical nightmare because now you got this peptide that's released <laughs> and the FDA or regulations are asking about that. Yep. But we know how to handle it all and... Uh, we're pretty uh, fortunate to be working with uh, just about every cutting edge mod modality on the market. Yeah. Yeah, disease indications are a lot of fun for us. So I mean, the, most people when they think of drug development, it's often immuno-oncology, right? And that's certainly one that we have a lot of depth in. Uh, you, there's not a cancer type out there that we haven't uh, been able to help treat a uh, given drug out. And then, you know, we're been in, in me metabolic health. And yep. You can touch on yep. that one. That's really popular. We're talking about GLP-1s and GLP things like ones, that. Yep. But that's, it's not just limited to those types of oligos. We work with every sort of siRNA and whatever is on the yeah, market. Neuroscience, <laughs> we do a lot yeah, of neuroscience, both out of our um, European site for biomarkers, as well as a lot of lipid panels, so a lot of glycosphingolipids that we can do mm -hmm. um, by mass spec, and we do a lot of those for 
the Parkinson's, the Alzheimer's, Gaucher's, some of those diseases. Um, like you mentioned, a lot of oncology, a mm -hmm. lot of rare disease we do. See, that's a big one. Yeah, and yeah. again, rare disease, a lot of times you have very limited patient samples. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're pediatric, then you have other issues around again, sensitivities and volume, and that kind of goes back to all under one roof because you have very limited volume. You want to split your sample as efficiently as possible. Um, and, and then the immunogenicity portion of that becomes, <laughs> it, because it becomes a little bit more than just a, you know, you've got your Oftentimes, in some rare diseases or gene therapies, you've got multiple immunogenicity assays because you've got to worry about antibody against the therapeutic itself, the humoral response against the drug, as well as if you're transducing or introducing a protein to a patient that's never seen it before, you are going to have immunogenicity and that's going to have to be handled a certain way as well. Yeah, and similar, again, back to kind of the modalities, I guess, you know, when you have an ADC or some of these complex molecules, you have a single sample that you have to split into three, four, five assays with a couple mm -hmm. immunogenicity, a couple biomarker, a um, couple PK, whatever. And so you want to conserve and, and save that as much as possible. So we, you know, look at all of those modalities. We look at all of those disease areas. And then we didn't really touch on, but we also look at almost every matrix that you could possibly yeah. get out yeah. of the body. Um, so tissues and... Not just human matrix, animals. Yep. We've worked on every sort of species. You can't, you couldn't name a species or uh, tissue type that we've worked with or haven't worked with, excuse me, it's pretty extensive. And then uh, getting back to even um, modalities like the gene therapy space, AAVs and things like that, we're able to do biodistribution studies on thousands of samples through our qPCR lab and we can turn those very, very quickly. And, and they can be done by LCMS as well, mm -hmm. so we really do have a, just it's, you know, it's real, it's a lot, I mean, I love working at KCAS Bio, <laughs> we can, there's not, we, our claim to fame is we can take on any PK assay on the market. Yeah, we can, we can support PK and immunogenicity for every drug modality on the market. Well, and the other, I guess, the other maybe plug to make or comment to make, right, is um, I think a lot of our employees enjoy it as well because you really mm. get a lot of breadth and depth across all of these platforms, all of these technologies. And so we get um, people that want to learn and are passionate mm. about learning and driving the science. And, you know, you every day fun. you work on something new. I mean, I've been in this, you know, same for you, like 20, 30, 30 yeah. years, right? Yeah. And, Every day you still learn something. You, you leverage all your knowledge and your tribal knowledge and all of the stuff that you can throw at it, but then it's always some new challenge that really keeps everybody going, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's a good point. It's really yeah. fun to see all the up and coming, I'll say 20 something year old, 30 something year olds <laughs> that, you know, I remember being that age and I, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed, we do a lot of training internally, she and I, mm -hmm. uh, not just for a scientist, but a lot of our business development team, our commercial team, and that's, that's really an, a really fun thing to be able to do because it's all under one roof again. Yeah. And, uh, really, our sponsors benefit greatly from that because our, our all of our young scientists are getting, you, you're better off, it's that the orthogonal pr approach to solving something is what we're really good at because we have so many platforms, so many experts, so many world experts yeah. in these things that as a young scientist in our organization, if you're familiar with how to do a hybrid mass spec assay or an LCMS mass assay, it does help you think better solving the LBA one in front of you. Like that type of yes. synergy is really, really the exposure for the scientists. Yeah, important. it's very much problem solving. It's not just like the way I say, always a hammer, always a nail, right? It's mm. whatever is the best technology to solve that problem and think critically, critical path experiments. How do we drive this fast, efficient, you know, correctly, yeah. all that. And you, this is, I'm gonna steal your thunder here. Sponsors will come to us and they'll ask, what tool should I use, mm -hmm. right? Well, we've got a really big tool chest, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe others might have a screwdriver and it might just be a Phillips screwdriver. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a common screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver, a buzzsaw, a hammer. We got mm -hmm. all sorts of tools that we can help you with for, for PK analysis, as well as the immunogenicity. Yeah, the sun never sets on KCAS Bio today, right? <laughs> That's what we say. So we're much more than a small molecule shop. Um, as somebody who's been at the company for 12 years now doing ligand binding assays, obviously we, we cover it all. We, we have small molecules, large molecules, cell-based gene therapies, or what some call immune effector cell therapies, gene therapies, you know, and gene therapy is a huge, huge uh, kind of class of drugs, you got peptides, oligos, everything right and, and we've got sites in we got a site in Lyon we got a partner in Melbourne Australia 
I mean, like I said, the sun never really sets on KCAS bio, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're an evolving company, right? As the marketplace and the science has evolved over years, back 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, right? We were pretty much a small molecule um, kind of industry, yeah. right? The whole industry was developing small molecule drugs. In the last maybe 10, 20 years, it's made a, a, a pivot or a shift to large molecule, all of these complicated modalities that we talk about now. So we always stay very evergreen as we, mm -hmm. as the science evolves, we evolve as an organization and we add service lines and we add technologies that will always be um, critical path, key to solving problems. And I think yeah. um, that really is what's allowed us maybe to grow so effectively and efficiently over the last 10, yeah, 15 we're, years. We're a 45 year old organization yeah. and yeah, predominantly for the first 20-ish, 25 years, we were small molecules. It's, it's been a struggle, <laughs> and I don't know if that's the right word, but it's been it's been a, it's been interesting that people still view us as small molecule, although we're, we work on protein mass spec, ligand binding assays. In fact, the lion's share of our business is in biologics yeah, today versus for sure. small molecules. And again, I think it's a reflection of where the industry is today. So we we go with that, right? If it's 50-50, if it's 75-25, we'll evolve as yeah, that evolves. That's it.